the woman picked up the champagne bottle and forcefully smashed it against the submarine. Unexpectedly, the bottle, which was supposed to shatter, remained intact and bounced back. The expressions of the Soviet officers and soldiers present instantly changed. According to naval tradition, if the champagne does not break before launching, it is considered a bad omen. This proved to be true, as the submarine faced constant disasters from its inception. It was known as the unluckiest nuclear submarine in naval history. During its construction, nine workers mysteriously died. To this day, the exact cause has never been determined. From then on, soldiers referred to it as the Widowmaker, and the unexpected incident during the launching ceremony was just the beginning of the nightmare. Afterward, they conducted the final tests on the submarine. During a missile launch test, a serious malfunction occurred. The captain was furious and requested a thorough inspection before any mission. However, the higher-ups insisted on proceeding as planned. At the time, the Cold War was in full swing, and the US and the Soviet Union, the only two remaining superpowers, were engaged in a tense standoff. A single misstep could trigger World War III. To counter the US's constant nuclear threats, the Soviet Union urgently needed to showcase its nuclear retaliation capabilities. Thus, on April 30, 1990, 1961. Despite the potential risks, the Soviet military insisted on deploying the still-experimental K-19 nuclear submarine to the North Atlantic near Greenland to carry out a launch mission. This location was within range of the United States. Before the mission, the High Command decided to replace Captain Mikhail Polenin with Alexei Vostrakov. The soldiers were meticulously preparing supplies for the journey. One soldier accidentally picked up the wrong medicine. The doctor noticed and hurried after him, only to be struck and killed by a truck on the spot. <laughs> Even before the submarine left the port, ten people had already died. This heightened the already growing fear among the crew. Mikhail approached the new captain, Alexei, to convey the concerns of the crew. You know what the men are calling this boat? The Widowmaker. Five died from fumes sealing the tanks, another four in construction, and now the doctor, the champagne bottle. Ten dead. And we haven't left dock. Surprised they confide their fears to their commanding officer. But military orders are absolute, and they had no choice but to take the risk. Under the watchful eyes of many, they slowly sailed out of the port. Not long after, another accident occurred. At a depth of 30 meters, the submarine began to leak. Shortly after, the newly appointed Alexei ordered a fire drill in the kitchen. To make it as realistic as possible, they turned off all the lights in the compartments. This made it even harder for the already unfamiliar crew to navigate the submarine. They scrambled in a state of panic. Although the kitchen fire was eventually put out, many personnel were injured or killed. Alexei was dissatisfied with the results and immediately ordered a second drill, insisting on continuing until they achieved a passing score. At that moment, the nuclear reactor crew noticed an issue with one of the gauges. The needle often inexplicably pointed to the safety threshold. A few hard knocks would reset it, so they didn't think much of it. Meanwhile, Alexei was preparing to simulate the launch of torpedo number 8. Sonar detected an ice layer forming above them. Mikhail suggested diving to a safer depth before proceeding, but the Alexei disagreed. In actual combat, the ice layer would remain, and the enemy would not allow them time to dive. Although the soldiers were reluctant, they followed orders. During the torpedo transport process, a soldier's hand was accidentally caught in a pulley. His fingers were crushed on the spot. As his teammates rushed to help, the torpedo became unbalanced and injured another soldier. Despite the casualties, Alexei insisted on continuing the drill, completely disregarding the soldiers' lives. The crew grew increasingly resentful of this madman, believing he was tormenting them for no reason. Fortunately, they completed the drill without further incident. Soon they reached the missile launch zone. If they successfully launched the missile, they could return to the home port. However, Alexei did not immediately execute the launch. Instead, he ordered an emergency dive. The submarine had already reached its maximum depth of 250 meters. Yet Alexei was still unsatisfied and wanted to go deeper. Mikhail argued that this was just a drill, and there was no need to risk the lives of the entire crew. But Alexei ignored the warnings and ordered a further descent. Then, disaster struck. The submarine, carrying three nuclear warheads, began to deform at 300 meters. The immense pressure caused terrifying creaking noises within the hull. The soldiers held their breath, too afraid to make a sound. Fortunately, K-19, the most advanced nuclear submarine of its time, survived the 300-meter depth test. Just then, Alexei ordered a simulated flooding drill in the torpedo room, commanding the submarine to rapidly ascend at full speed. The crew was horrified. They knew that the ice layer above them posed a severe risk. One wrong move and they could explode. But Alexei dismissed their fears, saying it was an order. With no choice, they complied. As the submarine rapidly ascended, the interior began shaking violently. At 110 meters, the shaking worsened as the ballast tank drained. Mikhail requested a pause at a safe depth, but Alexei refused. The uncontrolled ascent caused the hull to tilt dangerously. In a 
panic, Alexei ordered the engines shut down, but the submarine, propelled by momentum, continued rising uncontrollably. <laughs> With a crash, it broke through the ice and got stuck on the surface. They were now only 100 kilometers from a NATO base, at risk of being detected. Yet Alexei ignored the danger and ordered the missile launch bay doors to open. Once everything was ready, the soldier pressed the launch button. Fifteen seconds later, a nuclear missile emerged, successfully test-fired right at NATO's doorstep. The crew cheered and celebrated the historic moment by playing soccer on the ice. Little did they know, this photo would be their last recorded memory. Shortly after, command ordered K-19 to patrol the U.S. East Coast, forcing them to pass through NATO waters. Despite the perilous journey, they had to obey orders. However, while the crew rested, a coolant pipe in the nuclear reactor suddenly exploded. Alarms blared as pressure dropped rapidly. The soldier quickly pulled out the emergency manual and cautiously read it aloud. Lieutenant, I noticed the pumps were drawing too much power during the turbine tests, but I didn't think it was serious. A tiny oversight had nearly doomed the entire crew. The reactor's temperature continued to soar. To make matters worse, the radio system suffered an electrical failure, leaving them unable to contact headquarters for help. Soon, the reactor reached 900 degrees, a temperature nearing the melting point of the fuel rods. If it continued to rise, a chain reaction could trigger a high-energy atomic explosion. With three nuclear warheads and liquid fuel on board, an explosion would cause severe ecological devastation and nuclear contamination in the surrounding sea. The NATO base, 100 kilometers away, would also be affected. If the U.S. used this as a pretext for war, the consequences would be unthinkable. They had only four hours left. The only solution was to send crew members into the reactor chamber for manual repairs. The captain immediately assembled a repair team. However, to their shock, the submarine had no radiation suits, only chemical protection gear, which was as useful as a raincoat against radiation. To keep morale intact, they lied to the soldiers telling them the suits would protect them. Thus, six brave soldiers entered the reactor room in three shifts, each working for ten minutes before being replaced. The first team stepped forward with unwavering determination. They cut off the air supply, adjusted the valves, and welded the cooling pipe. After a grueling ten minutes, the second team rushed in. Inside, radiation saturated the air. Each time a team exited, they vomited immediately before even giving their reports. A medical check revealed that the radiation levels in their bodies had exceeded the instrument's maximum reading. This meant that within three days, they would die in excruciating pain. This terrified the next team. Some hesitated, forcing others to take their place. After three rounds of emergency repairs, they sealed the cooling pipes just as the reactor temperature reached 925 degrees. They sealed the chamber doors, stuffed water-soaked cloth into the gaps, and forcefully turned the valve. Coolant began to flow, and the temperature dropped just before reaching 1,000 degrees. But the problem wasn't over. With the reactor offline, the submarine lost most of its power, meaning it would take at least a week to return to base. By now, radiation had spread throughout the vessel, contaminating all food supplies. They rationed the few remaining metal-sealed rations to survive. The crew moved to the top deck to stay as far from the radiation as possible. Mikhail proposed heading to the NATO base 100 kilometers away to seek help from the Americans. But Alexei outright refused. He would not allow Soviet soldiers to surrender to the enemy, especially not on a submarine built to challenge the U.S. Yet, someone had been watching closely. If you want to die, don't take me with you. Realizing this was their only chance at survival, a Soviet officer and the political commissar held a secret discussion. In extreme cases, the commissar had the authority to relieve a commanding officer of duty if higher command was deemed negligent. Just then, a destroyer appeared ahead, followed by a helicopter flying toward them. The Soviet sailors erupted in cheers on the deck, but as the aircraft got closer they realized it was the Americans. The radio officer informed Alexei that the Americans were using an emergency frequency to offer assistance, but Alexei refused to yield. The helicopter hovered above the submarine, awaiting a response. Facing the U.S. military, the soldiers took off their pants one after the other, exposing their butts to provoke the U.S. military. What they didn't know was that inside the submarine, their radiation-poisoned comrades were in agony, begging the doctor to save them. But there was nothing the doctor could do, only offer words of comfort. Then, the recently repaired cooling pipes ruptured again, and the reactor's temperature soared. Alexei knew that if the submarine exploded now, the nearby U.S. destroyer would be caught in the blast, a potential spark for war. He ordered all crew members to return inside, preparing to sink the submarine with everyone on board. Upon hearing this, one sailor jumped into the sea 
and swam toward the U.S. destroyer. Meanwhile, inside the submarine, the crew mutinied, overthrowing Alexei. Mikhail was unaware of the situation. He was busy fighting a fire with the crew. By the time he returned to the command room, the officers handed him control of the submarine. But the moment Mikhail took the gun, he ordered two men arrested. He accused them of threatening their commanding officer, calling their actions a military coup tantamount to treason. After regaining authority, Alexei finally admitted that the crew needed to understand their predicament. Through the intercom, he told everyone the truth. The reactor had failed, and an explosion could happen at any moment. If that happened, the NATO base and U.S. destroyer would be destroyed as well. The U.S. would retaliate, possibly triggering nuclear war. The only way to prevent disaster was to dive to a safe depth and attempt one last repair. After hearing Alexei's explanation, the entire crew accepted their fate. Alexei then sent a lieutenant into the reactor room for repairs. Eighteen minutes passed, but the lieutenant never returned. Fearing the worst, Alexei rushed in and dragged him out, only to find that the lieutenant had gone blind. But the cooling pipes were successfully welded, and the reactor temperature stabilized. The crisis was averted, yet lethal radiation still saturated the submarine. With no other choice, Alexei made a decision that defied Soviet military tradition. He sent an SOS signal to the Americans. The U.S. destroyer rushed to assist. But just then, Soviet High Command sent an urgent telegram. They denied Alexei's request to evacuate the crew. When a U.S. nuclear submarine arrived, the crew began evacuating. The radiation-exposed soldiers suffered severe poisoning. Some died immediately, while others succumbed on the journey home. The radiation had already spread throughout the submarine, and every crew member suffered exposure. In the following years, at least 20 sailors died from radiation-related illnesses. The disaster had been caused by a defective weld in K-19's primary cooling circuit, a quality control failure that nearly led to nuclear war. Finally, in 1965, after extensive repairs, K-19 returned to the Northern Fleet. But by then, it had earned a chilling new nickname, Hiroshima. 